It's great to be part of a family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we have been in your presence, no doubt about it, and we have felt your warmth, and we have felt your joy, we have felt your reverence, Lord, and we just invite you again to speak to us now as we contemplate your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's see. Today's message is not for the faint of heart, nor for spiritual beginners. I have given a couple of warnings in this series as I've been leading to Genesis 16 that you need to be ready. Now, if you are in one of those categories, or maybe you're a guest or a a visitor here, don't feel out of place, don't feel like you shouldn't be here. God has His plan, amen? And I know He wants to speak to your heart. But this is going to require a certain level of spiritual maturity. This is going to require a certain level of openness when we get into the topic today. So you have been warned. (laughs) When we talk about the, the big words of Christianity, and I will have a kid's quiz, and if Jaden can help me and Toby would help me in just a minute, we're not going to get there, I have a little introduction. We use all these different words, and we love these words of faith and hope and love and grace and mercy and all these things, and, and sometimes they become so familiar to us that we haven't always uh, uh, taken the time to really ask ourselves what they mean or how they apply to our lives. And we love grace, and we've been going through a series looking at how God was trying to develop a family through Abram or Abraham to establish a pattern of salvation, and that through the model of the family, God wanted to establish a powerful witness for who He was to bring salvation to our earth. And so we've looked at different elements in the story of Abram. Last week, we looked at a pinnacle experience of Abram where God affirms the faith of Abram. God declares him righteous, and and he has this mountaintop experience with God. He has a vision of God. But when we translate to chapter 16, we see that he didn't allow it to really change him. And when we, sing, when we think about God's grace and we, we sing amazing grace, and I love the song selection of our praise team, the very first song, your grace is enough. Isn't that a beautiful promise? You know, I think that comes from where Paul in 2 Corinthians says, his grace is sufficient for his power is made perfect in weakness, right? His grace is enough. Are you thankful that his grace is enough for you? Are you thankful for that? Well, how is your grace towards your fellow man? Is your grace enough? You know, when we sang, yes, Lord, I was keeping notes. I was, Sabrina. Keep your notes because I'm just praying. I, I, I want to say the right thing to you here this morning. I want God to be heard in this place. When we sang, yes, Lord, uh, one of the lines in that was, your promise will endure. Are you thankful for God's promise? God gave Abram some pretty powerful promises. He said, in you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed, and I'm going to make you into a great nation, and you're going to have kids, and it's just going to be one. God gave Abram a great promise, and his promise will endure. How about your promises? Do they endure? Here's the point. It's, It's great to appreciate God's grace for ourselves. We love to say, thank you, God, for being gracious to me. But have you allowed that grace to transform you so that you are gracious to others? See, that's the whole point. That's the whole point. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a phrase, you've heard this before, it's been, we, we love grace for ourselves, but justice for others. You heard that before? When you're driving down the road and you're in a hurry, you're like, everyone, I, I know I'm, I'm speeding, I know I'm cutting people, but I'm in a hurry. I got this appointment. I got to get to school. I got to get to work. I'm late. I need everyone to be gracious to me because I'm in a hurry, right? We we expect a a certain level of, you've all been there before, and now it's my turn. But boy, when someone cuts you off in traffic, are you like, oh, I've been there, man. Let me slow down. You get right over. Gracious to you. Is that your first inclination? Or is it, man, where's a cop when you need one? 
Uh, at, At some level, we all understand this. By grace, you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What does that mean? You know there's more than 20 English definitions for the word grace? We use this word a lot, and we can go into different defining meanings of it. The basic Christian definition of grace is unmerited favor. It's unearned. It's just the decision that God makes on our behalf to say, you're my child. You've not earned salvation. You don't deserve salvation, but I love you anyways, and I'm going to give you my grace. Grace is the capacity to put the needs of others ahead of our own needs. It's love in action. It's unselfishness in a practical way. And if you ever are needing a definition of grace, just look at the cross. You can't see it's behind the, uh, behind the screen. We're going to fix that here someday though, right? Going to do difference with, so we can see the cross. If you need a definition of grace, just look at the cross. What was Jesus doing? He was putting your needs, he was putting your life, your hope, your salvation, even if it cost him his own life. That's grace. That's why Jesus says, if you want to follow after me, you've got to take up your own cross. There's a narcissism in Christianity, and forgive me, if you've been here many times before, you know that I've, I say this with certain regularity. There's a bit of narcissism in Christianity where we tend to think of it all about ourselves. Lord, am I saved? Am I good enough? Have I reached it? Are you, do you love me? Have you forgiven my sins? And by the way, there's nothing wrong with wanting to have transparency and clarity in your relationship with God. But if we never move beyond that, if it's always about me, we are missing the whole point of Christianity. Christianity is God saying, you are my child, you are forgiven, now go and offer that same love and grace to others. Be transformed. Your grace is enough. And he wants you to receive his grace, but he wants you to be transformed by his grace. For many people, Genesis 16 is a kind of a blip in the life of Abram. Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 are great, powerful moments for Abram and for his family. God's promises are abundant, and there's all kinds of wonderful things. And then in Genesis 16, and and even in your commentaries, it's kind of like an aside. Oh, yeah, we also need to explain where the Ishmaelites come from, so let's just uh, look at it from this. But I think it's fundamentally and far different that Genesis 16 is actually a pinnacle lesson for the church and for God's people in the lessons and the needs of grace. His grace is still amazing, amen? And I'm going to skip a slide here and go to the next one first. This is one of the the passages when I began this series that is so important, so fundamental to me. The greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. Now, just when you think about that statement and everything else, of course, the cross is what we want to draw everyone to, Right? The cross is what, where the power is. The cross is where salvation is found. But the cross must come into our families and transform them. If it doesn't do that, then what point is the power of the cross? If we're not letting it change us. The greatest evidence of the power of Christianity is not your ability to recite the 28 fundamental beliefs it's not your ability to, to uh, just live a very uh, uh, circumspect lifestyle. It's does your family reveal and reflect the power of God's grace in your life? Nothing will be greater in sharing the love of Jesus with our world than when people see grace in your family. Grace is between your relationship with your spouse, grace in how you raise your children, grace in how you interact with your neighbors, grace in how we fellowship in God's church. Nothing, this will recommend the truth as nothing else can. Amazing. I'm going to go back to that previous statement. The grace of Christ and this alone can make this institution, she's talking about marriage, what God designed it to be. Grace alone is what she says as an agent for the blessing and uplifting of humanity, both personally and in how we reflect that to our fellow man. And thus the families of earth in their unity and peace and love may represent the family of heaven. I don't know if I'm there yet. 
I got a ways to go. Any of you reached that point yet? Are you there? Perfect unity, peace, and love? It's a high bar. They may represent the family of heaven. Through the revelation of His grace, hearts that were once indifferent or estranged may be united in bonds that are firmer, more enduring than those of earth. The golden bonds of a love that will bear the test of trial. We're going to talk about grace today. We're not going to talk about grace. We're going to look at a story in the Bible that reveals our great need of grace. And um, I pray that your heart will hear what God has to say. Can I grab the black one? Brenda, can I grab the black one? And if I can get a little help. You know, last week, because of Children's Church, I did teen trivia. Teens were pretty bashful and shy. So I want to see if the kids today can get into the, the quiz a little bit more. We've been going through the life of Abram. So tell me the, the names of the wives of Abram or Abraham. Help me out. Any of our young people? I saw you up here for Children's Church. I know you're here somewhere. All right, I see Dylan and Eric. Yeah, just help give me some coverage here, Jaden and Toby. All right, whichever one. Dylan? Sarah. Say it. Sarah. Sarah, do you remember any other names? Sarah. Okay, any other names? No. Okay, Eric, do you remember any? Uh. That's all right. So we've got Sarah or Sarai or Sarai. Uh, any other names? Hagar. All right, Hagar. Did you know there's one more? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna give it to you so we can move on. He actually had three people identified as wives in the Bible. Keturah was the third, um, and we'll talk about some of these marriages as we go on. How many children did Abraham have? Father Abraham had many sons. All right, I see. Is that Jacobet? Okay, right, right in front. There you go. Many nations, yeah, but can you think, we're looking at a numerical value here. It's okay, you can guess. Twelve. Twelve. It may have been, um, we'll see if Abel wants to share as well. More than the stars. More, yeah, more than the stars. Okay, you guys looking at the descendants, I get that. You've been paying attention. We'll have one more, one more. Let's come up here to, to Isaiah, uh, we'll do Isaiah and Geo, see what they have to say. Two. Two, and then Geo. Fourteen. Fourteen. Okay. He had at least eight. <laughs> at least eight. Eight boys are named, but we know that sometimes they have daughters that aren't named. So it's possible that he had some daughters as well, but we know of at least eight named boys. Uh, Isaac, Ishmael, and then he had six boys with Keturah. May have been some daughters in there, but they're not always mentioned. Where was Hagar from? I can't say it the Hebrew way, Hagar. I, I just can't quite get it right. Where was she from? Was she from Canaan? Was she a Philistine? That's all right if the boys, if you guys, you aren't cheating, are you? Oh, and that smile on your face has got me wondering. Sean? Egypt. Okay, we'll give it to you. She's an Egyptian. She's from Egypt, not modern day Egypt. Uh, ancient Egypt is where she was from. What was Hagar's son's name? Did I give this one away already? What was Hagar's son's name? Do you remember his name? Any of our young people? All right. Delia? Isaac. That's a different son. It's close, kind of, but it's not Isaac. All right, I see Eric. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah over here. Yes, sir. Um, oh, right. Ishmael. Ishmael, you got it. Ishmael means God hears the L at the end of the name. Uh, is the reference to God, and Ishmael means God hears, or God takes heed even. All right, last question. I haven't even asked it. You guys are cheating. We're not going to do that. All right, they're helping with the PowerPoint, so they get these in advance. What amazing privilege does God give to Hagar? Here's some options for you. She sees God, she hears God, she names God, she na God names her son. Any thoughts on this? What amazing privilege? All right, Eric's about to explode. Eric? God names his son. Yeah, wow, that's an interesting idea. Dylan? She hears God. All right, there's two possibilities. All right, we got Abel and then Geo. We're we'll do these last two. Abel, what do you say? All of them. Abel, all right. Uh, don't call on Abel anymore. <laughs> she sees God. Say it again. She sees God. Okay. 
You know what? You're all right and able. I was just playing with you. You're right. It, I do this a lot. It's all of them. All of them. And uh, this is an amazing, amazing privilege that God gives to Hagar. Thank you, young men, for helping me out. Just like to get into the story a little bit. If you um, have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis 16. But let me give you just a little bit of a dovetail or a history of how we have gotten here. Genesis 16 is the culmination of Abram's first 11 years in Canaan and serving God. He gets called out of Haran at age 75. At the beginning of Genesis 16, he's 85. So um, by the time the story ends, he'll be 86. So this is the, like, the bookends of the first pericope or story of Abram. His sojourn in Egypt was a disaster. We looked at that in Genesis 12. Wealth leads to Lot's departure. The, the closest thing he has to a son at this time is his nephew Lot, but because of their great wealth, Lot decides to move to Sodom. War forces Abram to rescue Lot, and he has the experience with Melchizedek. But Genesis 15 that we studied last week is where Abram, it says he believes in God and it was accredited to him or it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. And, you would, and God renews his covenant. And you would think we're in a good place at the end of Genesis 15. You would think we have arrived. God has declared Abram righteous. He's declared him righteous in Genesis 15. Now, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. He didn't earn that. It's not uh, anything like that. It's the same uh, uh, promise of salvation that we have in the New Testament, that if we believe in Jesus uh, and we receive His grace, we have the promise of salvation. But when we come to Genesis 16, we see it revealed that He has not allowed that righteousness to translate and change Him. The family of God is still in trouble. Again, don't forget, the promise of God is in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Hagar had been living with Abram for 10 years now. She was probably one of the Egyptian servants given to Abram when Abram took his wife. If you remember the story in Genesis 12, Pharaoh was so excited at the beauty of, 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 of Sarah, he's like, Here, here's a bunch of gold, here's a bunch of servants. And the Bible says that female servants were given to Abram when he first went into Egypt. So Hagar had been living with the family of promise for 10 years. For 10 years, Hagar had been hearing about the hope of God. For 10 years, she had been listening to Abram and Sarah talk about the goodness of God. All right? She was there when he got wealthy in Canaan. She was there when Abram had victory in warfare and was blessed by Melchizedek. Maybe she wasn't physically there, but she knew the story. She was there when Abram, in Genesis 15, had the powerful vision of God in the flaming oven and the, and the um, flaming torches, and, and Abram is declared righteous. She is there. Ten years. Abram and Sarah still are childless, though. When the chapter begins, Sarah comes up with a plan. Abram is very passive in this story. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But God's grace intervenes and lessons are learned. So let's get into the story. We're going to go verse by verse in this. Try not to keep you here till 3 o'clock. Try to be done by 2.30. We'll see how it goes. Praise the Lord. Now, you've got to remember, I'm going to be gone for a few weeks, so I'm getting all my sermonizing in now. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be respectful and... It begins this way, now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. This is the twelfth time Sarah has been specifically called the wife of Abram. Over and over again in the narrative, it's, Abram, this is your wife. Sarah, this is, Sarah's your wife. She's not your sister. She may have been your half-sister, but once you married her, she's now your wife. Over and over and over, Moses is the author of Genesis. Moses is writing in the text, for anyone who will read, uh, Abram, you have a wife. And her name is Sarah. Abram, you have a wife. And her name is Sarah. Over and over. This is the twelfth time. This is significant. But she'd borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. And right from the beginning, the plot is set. Now remember, it's important to remember that the first audience listening to Moses regale these tales is the Exodus generation. Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt out of captivity, they are now on their way to their promised land, and they're coming to Moses every night saying, Moses, tell us more about Father Abraham. We've forgotten. We were worshiping the Egyptian gods for 400 years in Egypt. We've forgotten about our history. Tell us more stories about Father Abraham. So at the campfires 
of the Exodus generation, they would sit around and Moses would say, okay, where were we? Oh yeah, remember last night we talked about how God revealed himself to Abram and he was declared righteous and there was this powerful vision and all these wonderful, yes, yes. Well, now I've got another story to tell you. And as he begins the story, Sarah had, Abram's wife had no children and an Egyptian maid, but she had an Egyptian name whose name was Hagar. Right then you can imagine the, the Hebrew people going, don't do it, Abram, don't do it. We hear where this is going. We see where the plot is. Don't miss, too, that she is repeatedly called a maid, either Sarah's maid or an Egyptian maid. Okay, the language here is going to be very important and very specific. Sarah, Abram's wife, had no children, but she had an Egyptian maid. So Sarah says to herself, I have a plan. I got an idea. Now, I've talked about before how they come from a pagan world. Okay, they come from a world where polygamy and slavery and idolatry and child sacrifice are the norm. It was not abnormal. Even today, having a surrogate help you with children is not crazy. But in that world, it was not a wild idea. It was a common idea. Maybe even people suggested it to her. But Sarah looks at this situation and says, you know, I have a plan. So Sarah said to Abram, notice in this story, it's Sarah who leads Abram into sin. In Genesis 12, it was Abram who led Sarah into sin. When Abram said, don't tell everyone you're my wife, let's tell everyone you're my sister and see how that works. And in Genesis 12, by the way, Genesis 12 and Genesis 16 are bookends. These two stories set the boundaries of the story that God wants us to evaluate with the family of Abram. So in Genesis 12, it's Abram who leads Sarah into sin, but in Genesis 16, it's Sarah who leads Abram. And forgive me for just saying Sarah and Abram and not the uh, Sarai, or I, again, I'm not even sure, uh, I'm just using convenience here. This is what she says to her husband. Now behold, the Lord has prevented me. Notice she's, she's blaming God. This is the same thing Abram did in the last chapter when God comes to him and Abram says, well, what will you give me because you've not given me any kids? Sarah has the same problem. She says, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid, perhaps. Again, my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through here, through her. And the Bible says, and Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. He's extremely passive. He says nothing, at least that's recorded in Scripture. Now, As I've talked before, Abram is 85 at this point, but he lives to be 175. So we should not picture Abram as a modern-day 85-year-old, okay? He has the vitality and the longevity of someone who's going to live much older than 85. He would be middle-aged, right, by our measurement. He would be in his maybe late 40s. Okay? And we all know that when men reach that age, they no longer think about sex. They are no longer motivated by their baser instincts. There's an age we reach where that is no longer the dominating power in our life. Wow, you guys agree with me. I was being facetious. I was joking. Abram says nothing. Abram listened to the voice. Sarah, I'll do it for you. If this is going to make you happy, I don't take any pleasure in it. I just, uh, let me get my Barry White CDs and I'm off to Hagar's tent. It's good. Hagar is not asked her opinion in this. She is used as a slave. Who was the first generation listening to this story? It was Hebrews who had been in slavery in Egypt. And now an Egyptian is being used like a slave by Hebrews. By the way, when Moses wrote this and Abram listened to the wife of Sarah, it's a callback to when God said to Adam, because you've listened to the voice of your wife, we've got problems. Now, this is not, this is not saying you can't listen to your wife, all right? This is not saying that at all. This is saying when you're choosing 
someone else's voice other than God's voice, you've got a problem. And that's what happens here with Abram. He listened to Sarah's voice without checking with God first. And he'd already had an example in Adam and his poor choice. After Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife, Sarah, did what? Took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as his wife. This is the only time in Scripture Hagar is called Abram's wife. Only time. They were trying to keep it kosher. Let's pretend that, that you're married, then it'll be okay. But you see what Sarah did? She took Hagar. Remember back in Genesis 12? Who was getting taken back then? Sarah was. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And then when he finds out that he's married, Pharaoh says, why did you say she's my sister? So that I took her. Now she, here is your wife. Take her and go. Do you think Sarah appreciated being taken? And yet here she is doing the same thing when the roles are flipped. She takes Hagar. You know that this is a very common human condition. Often we can't stand things done to us that we enjoy doing to others. Any of you know anyone who loves to make fun of other people, but if you make fun of them, oh my goodness, it's a crisis. It's like you can dish it, but you can't take it. She is now reinforcing and doing the very behaviors that led to the disaster in Egypt. She took Hagar, just as she, 10 years previously, had been taken. These are not accidents. These are, are language uh, connections between the stories. So verse 4, he went into Hagar. I want you to notice, no maid in this one. No Egyptian no wife. It just says he went into Hagar, and she conceived. So she's obviously of a fertile age. She's of an age where conception is more likely, is more common. She's young. She's young. But Abram does it for Sarah. Notice what happens. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. How rapidly things begin to change and evolve in the story. As soon as Hagar recognizes her pregnancy, all of a sudden her stocks start to rise, and she says, you know what? You may be my mistress. You may have power over my life. But you want to know what? I can do something you can't do. I can have a baby. Clearly, God has abandoned you, and God has put me in your place. Her mistress was despised in her sight. This is the same word back in Genesis 12 when God says, Abram, when you're living out the promise, if people receive your blessing, that's fine. But the one who curses, it's the same word. The one who despises, the one who reviles you, I will curse. But he's saying that as long as you're following the plan. If you abandon grace and you go your own way, we're going to have to come up with a different plan. And Hagar despises Sarah. So Sarah said to Abram, may the wrong done me be upon you. This is your fault. How could you let this happen? I gave, now notice, she's not his wife anymore. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. She's very, she blames Abram from the whole thing. This is your fault. You should have seen this coming, which, by the way, is not altogether untrue. Just as Sarah could have stood up to Abram in Genesis 12, when Abram said, Sarah, let's lie to everyone. Let's tell everyone that you're my sister. I'm afraid for my life. Sarah could have said, that is not God's plan. I will not do that. Let's trust God. He will be with us. She could have, but she didn't. She passed passively went along. Abram does the same thing in this story. Abram could have said, Sarah, I know it's rough. I know we've been waiting for 10 years. I know God has been uh, uh, not fulfilling his promise yet, but let's be strong together. When Sarah needed Abram to be strong, he let something else dominate his decision. A young woman by the name of Hagar. 
May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarah, this is, the, this is getting tough here. Abram said to Sarah, the righteous man Abram, the one who believed in the Lord, and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. Abram said to Sarah, behold, what does he call her? Behold, my wife? She was never my wife. God never calls her his wife. We might call many things on earth marriage, but if God doesn't recognize it, he doesn't say it's marriage. Abram said to Sarah, behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. What's the phrase we're all very familiar with? Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. His unborn child was in the womb of Hagar. And he doesn't stand up for her. She's in your power. He doesn't even say, go to the Lord and let's talk with God. He says, whatever you want to do that is good in your sight, I'm okay with. So, Sarah treated her harshly. Probably had her beaten. Now, it's kind of par for the course. When you have a slave that gets out of line, you hire some strong man with a whip, and you beat a slave who's out of line. Sarah treated her harshly. This word, harshly, inspired by God, written down by Moses, is the same word that God uses to describe the affliction of the Hebrews in Egypt. So they appointed taskmasters over them to treat them harshly. But the more they afflicted them, the more they treated them harshly, the more they multiplied. And so she flees. And that word fled is the same word that Moses uses when he describes the Israelites fleeing from Egypt. She runs away. Now, back when we looked at Genesis 12, I told you one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture is when Egypt escorted out the family of God, right? The family of promise, the family by which all the families of the earth were to be blessed, brought shame and brought curses and brought problems into Egypt so that the Egyptians physically escorted them out. They said, we don't want any of your blessings. You've brought nothing but problems out of here. But how tragic is Hagar fleeing God's people? How many of you know someone who has fled from the people of God? How many of you have at one point in your life fled the people of God because you were mistreated? How many of you have been tempted to say, you know what, if that's the blessing, I don't want any of it. You use me, you abuse me, you beat me. That's the kind of family you are. Sad, guys. An absolute mess. An absolute fiasco. Hagar said, I've had enough of your blessing. I've been hearing about it for 10 years. Maybe at some point she'd even moved in her heart towards accepting the God of Abram. I've had enough of this blessing that you claim to have. Hagar flees God's family. Hebrews, don't miss this. Hebrews do to an Egyptian what Egyptians would later do to Hebrews. What was the message the children of Israel are supposed to understand as Moses is telling them this story? What message are we to understand when we read this story? Morally, 
when we neglect the promise of God, when we don't allow the grace of God to transform us, we become just like the world. And when we're in power, we abuse people. Just like when other people are in power, they abuse us. Apart from the transforming grace of God, we are nothing. We allow our baser instincts to absolutely destroy the plan that God has for us in our family and our lives. Abram and Sarah do not pursue her. Sarah's like, good riddance. My competition's out of here. Abram, with his unborn child in Hagar, is just like, I'm just happy to have peace in the home again. And Hagar is like, I'm just glad to be out of that tragic situation. So in a way, everyone's happy. Let's get back to business. Except God. God's not happy. God can't leave it in this state. By the way, guys, God wants to heal your family too. When your family's in crisis, God knows and he does not give up. The family may not pursue you, but God will pursue you. The very next verse, I wish you would highlight it, underline it, circle it, because it says, now the angel of the Lord found her. The angel of the Lord pursued her. The angel of the Lord found her. The only one who would come after her the angel of the Lord. This is a first reference to the angel of the Lord in the Bible. Who is the angel of the Lord? It's Jesus. One of my favorite moments in the Chosen series is in the very first episode when Jesus meets Mary in the bar and she's depressed and she's discouraged and she says, leave me alone. And she walks out of the bar and the very next scene is Jesus pursuing her. Jesus found her. The angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord manifests himself in many ways in the Bible, but in Hagar's example, we're going to see a very special revelation. Most of the time, the angel of the Lord is in a, uh, a, a vision of some kind or a, an object, um, but when it comes to Hagar, it's different. And I want you to notice the found her part. Who is it that finds us? For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And the angel of the Lord seeks her out because she's lost. She's on her way to Egypt again, by the way. That's on the way to Egypt to Shur. But now she's in a lot of trouble because she's a runaway slave. Even if she goes back to Egypt, where did she come from? Egypt. What was she when she was in Egypt? A slave. What would happen if the Egyptians found out that one of their gifts that they gave to a powerful Hebrew chieftain had lost one of, her, one of their slaves? She's in a lot of trouble. She can't go forward. She can't go back. She's in the wilderness. She's lost. But God finds her. And he said to her, Hagar, notice this, Sarah's maid. Sarah's maid, not Abram's wife, Sarah's maid. Where have you come from and where are you going? Now, always remember, when God asks a question, it's not because He doesn't know, it's because He wants us to think. Where have you come from? But more importantly, where are you going to go? What options do you have in front of you? Notice she only answers the first question, I'm fleeing. I'm getting out of here. I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. I am fleeing the people of God, because they've hurt me. Where are you going? Very similar to God's question to Adam when God pursued Adam and Eve after the fall, and He asked them, where are you? Where are you? Where are you going to go? The next words of the angel are very difficult. The angel of the Lord said to her, you got to go back. Not only did He say return, but he said, you have to submit yourself to her authority. We're going to come back to this at the end. 
Because I think in Hagar's mind, she's thinking, are you crazy? Do you know what happens to runaway slaves? That's insane. And they mistreated me. How can the angel of the Lord call Sarah to return to that family? How is he going to help her understand that that's his plan? Return and submit yourself to their authority? Where were you when I was suffering? What are you doing about the suffering in the world? But the angel gives a promise. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants. He duplicates the, pres- the uh, promise that he'd given to Abram about the descendants of Abram being like a multitude and like the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. He gives the similar, not same, but similar promise to Hagar. And in so doing, he's saying, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to bless you, and the fruit of your womb is going to be blessed. Trust me on this, stick with me, and we're going to find a way through this together. I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to follow. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael. First time in the Bible God names a child is Ishmael. First time. Because, I, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. God acknowledges you were suffering. They did treat you harshly. He's not blind to that. He recognizes that she has suffered. But, she, but God promises to be with her and bless her. God names Ishmael. God hears. God hears and sees our suffering. And you ask, well, why doesn't God do anything about it? But that's the, the whole point. He is doing something about it. He is trying to establish a community and a people transformed by grace. But in this world, we still have tribulation, and Jesus himself suffered. God does not deny that his family caused affliction to Hagar. The promise continues. Now, this is very strange language, but I want you to understand how powerful it is. The angel promises Hagar, your son will be a wild donkey of a man. Now, It's been a long time since anyone called me that. (laughs) But consider this is a different time and place. And the same author who wrote Genesis probably wrote the book of Job as well. Moses probably wrote both. The wild, untamed donkey was a symbol of an industrious survivor and, more importantly, of unbound freedom. It's a promise that Hagar's children will not be slaves. Notice what God says in Job. Who sent out the wild donkey free? Who loosed the bonds of the swift donkey? To whom I gave the wilderness for a home, the salt land for a dwelling place. He scorns the tumult of the city. The shoutings of the driver, he does not hear. The wild donkey is not behind the lash. The wild donkey is not the servant to the city and and to that. He's free. He explores the mountains of the pasture and searches after every green thing. When God promises Hagar that her children will be like the wild donkey, he's saying they will not be slaves. I will protect them. I will make them different than the people who have enslaved you. He goes on to say, yet... His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live to the east of all his brothers. These people are going to struggle with oppression, both in attempting to oppress others and resisting oppression themselves. Now, I don't have time to go into it. Big debate about whether the descendants of Ishmael are the Arabs or not. Many Arab tribes say they are descendants of Ishmael. The Quran doesn't say that, and depending on the commentary you read, it's going to go in one or two directions. However, I'm going to stand before you and say, I don't know how you don't see the Arab peoples in the descendants of Hagar. I think they fit the prophecy and the description very well. And again, most Arabs themselves claim it. Even when it says they will live to the east of all their brothers. Who lives to the east of Israel? Is this, this isn't hard. Get a map out. Look. (laughs) Now again, this is many generations ago. I don't dispute that others might argue differently, but I think it is a reference to the Arabs. And notice this, if it is, if it is, says he will live to the east of all his what? Brothers. Who are the brothers of Ishmael? The descendants of Abram. So in a way, it's God saying, Israel, remember, I've given you Canaan, 
But all these nations around you, they're your brothers. What an absolute tragedy that the descendants of Abraham have not figured out how to live in harmony. Well, it's easy to point the finger, but here in the church, we got it all worked out. We're just great with each other. We never have any problems in the church, do we? We always treat each other like brothers and sisters. No, we have a lot of work to do ourselves. But what a tragedy. He, he, Moses says he's going to listen to the east of all of his brothers. Israel, they're your brothers. Inheritors of a different promise through Hagar. I'm almost done. Another hour. We'll be good. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. Notice what it says. It does not say she called on the name of the Lord. It says she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You're a God who sees. For she said, I, if I even remained alive here after seeing him, therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It's between Kadesh and Bered. This is profound. Hagar names God. This is the only time in all of Scripture that God allows a human being to name Him. Only time. Moses never names God. Moses asks God at the burning bush, I don't even know what your name is. When I go to tell the uh, uh, Pharaoh to let my people go, what God should I say? Moses doesn't know that. Jeremiah never names God. Paul never names God. Peter never names God. John the Apostle never names God. No one in the Bible, God is always the one revealing His name. He says, I am the God who provides, therefore you can call me Jehovah Jireh. I am the God who heals, so you shall call me Jehovah Rapha. God is the one who reveals His name to us. This is the only time in all of Scripture that God condescends to allow a human being in their destitute and their desperation to give him a name. And it's given to a woman who is a Gentile slave. In that world, in that culture, that was three strikes and you're out. But God steps back and says, no, this is my daughter and I will receive the name that she gives me. Hagar names God, the only time, anywhere in the Bible, that God has given a name and accepts a name given by a human being. But the second part, have I even remained alive after seeing Him? She comes to the awareness that she is now in the presence of a divine being, and she realizes that her life could have been in danger, very similar to when Isaiah said, woe is me, I'm ruined because I've seen the Lord, I've seen the King. She has this deep awareness that she has had the privilege in a unique and powerful way of seeing God. She names God. She sees God. God hears her, and she hears God. So Hagar bore, bore Abram a son. Notice what's missing here. No maid. She's not an Egyptian. She's not a servant or a slave. She's simply Hagar. Hagar, a daughter. Hagar, a person. Hagar bore... This is not by accident, folks. Moses was inspired to do it this way. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. The next time we meet Abram will be 13 years later. Abram was 99 years old. He's 86 years old. Have I done the math right? 13 years. So it's going to take God 13 years of of working with Abram before he's ready to reveal himself and record that revelation in Scripture to us. For 13 years, Hagar will live and Ishmael will live in the community of Abram and Sarah. Chapter 16 is an apex moment in the life of God's family and a revelation and a witness to what a family becomes when we don't allow God's grace to transform us. I wish it was on the positive side. What is the message? Even God's family can hurt us sometimes. I I think I could even say even God's family will 
hurt us sometimes. You ever been hurt by a preacher? Ever been hurt by a Sabbath school teacher? Been ever been hurt by a sister? Hurt by a brother? We all need grace. We're not perfect. We need grace. When we forget God's promises, we become just like everyone else. I don't care how many years you've come to church. I don't care how many evangelistic series you've preached. I don't care how many dollars you've paid in tithe. I don't care how perfectly you've kept the Sabbath your whole life. That does not, in and of itself, eliminate your need of God's grace in your life. Without allowing the Holy Spirit to daily transform you like that, we allow the brokenness and wickedness of sin to once more infiltrate our family. When we forget God's promises, we become just like everyone else. God sees, hears, and pursues us when we flee. Amen? He never forgets. God is an expert at healing relationships. God asks us to stay with His family. This is the part I wanted to come back to. Why didn't God say, Hagar, I got you. I have a widow of Zarephath, just like Elijah went to. I'm going to have you go over here, and I'm going to bless your family. Don't go back to that crazy. I'm going to take care of you over here. Why did God choose to send Hagar back? You remember this part? When Hagar saw that she had conceived, what happened to her? She started right down the road of being arrogant and prideful and hurtful. See, here's the thing. Hagar needed the promise, and the promise was only found in one place, in the family of Abram and Sarah. It's not in Egypt, it wasn't in Canaan, and it wasn't in the wilderness. The promise was only in one place. It was in the family of Abram and Sarah, and she needed the promise. As much as Abram and Sarah needed it, she needed it. Because as soon as she had power in her life, as soon as she started to see that she had a a, a dominion, those same sinful tendencies began to boil up in her life. She needed the promise too. What is the promise? For the descendants of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. The promise is Jesus. Hagar needed Jesus. Now, the promises were spoken to Abram and to his seed. That is Christ. That was where God's salvation would be found. As difficult as it is at times, as broken as a family as we are at times, as untransformed by grace as we are at times, we are a family still progressing and striving and working together. And God has set His promise on us. Now, again, I want to make it clear. This is not a suggestion that we need to remain in abusive situations. This is not a suggestion that if there is no determination on anyone's part to do better, that we just have to simply submit. I don't think the story would lead to that. But Abram and Sarah were still where God had set His promise. And God was saying, Hagar, you need that promise. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to take care of you. But stay with the family. Let me take care of this and stay with the family. Jesus is what we all need. And Jesus has chosen to establish himself in our families. Have you allowed Him to transform you? Are you striving to understand what grace really means in your life? Are you trying to allow love 
to be active in your life, where you are putting the interests and needs of others ahead of yourself. That's what grace is. That's what grace is. And before God could do the next thing in Abram's life, Abram needed to understand that he still wasn't transformed by grace yet. He wasn't transformed yet. Friends, there's dozens of other meanings and applications and ways that we can study and appreciate this story. But I hope within this you have seen hope. I hope that you have found strength to strive in your journey and not give up. And I hope that you can allow God's grace to really transform you because that's what it's all about. If we're not changed by Him, then we're just like everyone else. How many of you want to be changed by His grace? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for being with us today. And Lord, thank You for this story. It is not a happy story. It's not what we would hope to find in Your family, especially someone that You have poured out so many blessings. We would expect different, and yet we see this very clear warning throughout the ages and even into our life that we desperately need you. We can have mountaintop experiences and we can express great moments of faith and and be declared righteous, but Lord, if we are not allowing your power to transform us, then we become a problem and we become hurtful. So Lord, please help us as a family, help us as a church to represent this quality and this beauty. No family can be successful without grace. May our individual families and our homes be growing and developing. May us as a church family also be growing because, Lord, we know you are coming soon. And we want this family to be that powerful testimony of how you save us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for enduring with me a little bit longer than normal, but uh, I hope that you have a wonderful Sabbath. Hopefully lunch will be ready momentarily. God bless you.